Hey, howdy guys, Connor McCaskill here, and joining me today is Armando Ferreira. Armando is joining us over on Zoom. How are you doing today, man? Pretty good, man, pretty good. I'm rocking the hat, you know, because uh, my hair is that. pretty jacked. <laughs> <laughs> so is mine. We're, uh, we're all having, like, quarantine hair, so... Well, you know, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? But today, Armando agreed to join me as we're going to just basically discuss the Canon EOS R5 and how it's going to fit into the camera market going into 2020, because it's a pretty exciting camera, all things considered, especially when we look at the specs of the camera. So Armando, do you mind kind of kicking this thing off and? listing off some of the specs that the R5 is gonna boast? Yeah, so I think the big one that everybody's really excited about is the 8K RAW full frame, no crop, you know, recording. Mm -hmm. I think that's huge because as of right now, as of filming this, as of today, there is no camera in this type of hybrid mirrorless that is capable of doing that. And I think that's huge. Um, how feasible that is, I don't know. We'll have to talk about that a little later. But um, yeah, I yeah. think the AK RAW is just pretty exciting because um, still no pricing yet. Although I have talked to some people that believe it's gonna be under 5K and they're pretty sure and they've been pretty spot on. So um, I think that might be the case here. I, I'm pretty sure about that. There you go, you heard it here first. So we're talking anywhere between four and 5K, right? Absolutely. That's a, I feel like that's a pretty uh, safe guess. I would say. And the thing is, a lot of people are saying, how is that even possible when you have the C300 Mark III that just came out and then the C500 Mark II, or yeah, C500 Mark II. Like how Mark is it II. possible that a yeah. camera that is able to have these kind of killer specs compete with a camera, like a cinema camera and cost half the price or a third of the price or a quarter of the price. Right. And, and the reality of it is that there's still a lot of things that the R5 doesn't have that the C500, C300 do not have like built-in ND filters, you know, XLR, stuff like that, dynamic range. I mean, that's a whole different video in its own, but there's a lot of different things that, you know, you have to take in into consideration. Right, all right, the R5 essentially has a quarter of the features of, for instance, the C500 Mark II. When you really boil it down, now it's getting similar specs and technically a better spec when you say 8K versus the 6K of the C500 Mark II, but they are completely different cameras. They are right. in different ball games, they're in different price points, they're for different people. So comparing those two cameras, although fun, isn't necessarily practical, I don't think. I agree, 100%. And, and and I think one of the things that you kind of, you brushed over, but I think it's kind of huge, especially for Canon, is no crop. Yeah. No crop. What? <laughs> I mean, that's something we've been begging for. Yeah, I mean, I'm shooting right now on the R, the regular R, and uh, I'm recording in 1080 so that it's wide. But if I wanted 4K, it'd be, what was it, a 1.67 <laughs> crop? Yeah, it's like a 1.73 or something like that. We'll basically be seeing yeah. like your beard only. Yeah, exactly, just my beard. So. I, it, it is unfortunate that's one of the biggest complaints we had with the R and the R5 is going to remedy that. Also, we're gonna be getting 4K 60, which is really good. And all of it will, of course, be able to record in 10-bit 422, I believe, correct? Yes, and that's kind of where I'm more excited about and I think a lot of people are more excited about. Uh, in fact, even with the C500 Mark II, and you know this because you, know, you, you help shoot these videos, mm -hmm. Um, we don't really shoot in RAW at all, unless it's like a big paid project or something that's, you know, like a short film. But in terms of like, even even like corporate stuff, um, I, in fact, a good friend of mine just shot a short film and he's using the C500 Mark II. Some of you guys may be familiar with him. His name is Rubidium. He has a YouTube channel called Crimson oh, Engine. Yeah, yeah he, he shot it uh, using 10-bit, not raw, because when he did side-by-side -side comparison, it was so good that it's like, and you know how it is, it's really flexible. You really don't need to shoot raw. Absolutely. I mean, unless, unless you're doing a movie or something like that. Of course, we did shoot raw, you and I, recently when we did, uh, and in fact, you just premiered it on your channel, the little like commercial short film piece that we did. And of course, it does look incredible, but the difference <laughs> between raw and 10-bit is just not as crazy as a jump it, for some reason, a, as you would kind of think it would be. And for the extra storage that it takes, it's almost not worth it. Right, right, the extra storage, it comes down to the law of diminishing returns. It's like, you're gonna pay so much more in terms of storage and capacity and all that for, you know, yes, an incremental upgrade, I would say. Right, 
Absolutely, absolutely. So other things that are coming with the Canon EOS R5 is going to be internal body image stabilization or IBIS as all of us love to rave about IBIS, IBIS, IBIS. We all love IBIS because it's a gimbal in your hands essentially without needing a gimbal. Um, YouTubers are ecstatic about it. I'm curious to see how good it is because this is the first, correct me if I'm wrong, the yeah. first Canon camera with IBIS. That is, that is right, you are correct. And we don't know how well it's gonna perform, so. Exactly. In fact, we recently saw, or actually you sent it to me, is that the uh, X-T4, um, a camera company that, Fujifilm, a camera company that has had IBIS in previous cameras, uh, they're having some weird glitch with the X-T4, which hopefully they remedy, but that's this isn't even their first camera. So IBIS is something that's not always easy to do. So it, it'll be really curious to see how good is this R5 IBIS, especially in the higher resolutions. Right, if it can right. do it in the high resolutions, can it do IBIS 8K? I don't think so, right? Yeah, I don't. I don't think it will because similar to like the C500 Mark II, um, where, it, where it has the electronic image stabilization, not IBIS. It's it's within mm -hmm. the uh, the um, software base. You can't do it in RAW, so you can only do it. Although I, I'm again, I'm not too sure if you are going to be able to do it, and also I'm not sure if you'll be able to combine IBIS with EIS, and also mm -hmm. IS with the lens. Because if that's the case, then you have like this crazy stabilization. Because um, I've heard that you'll, you'll be able to do IBIS and EIS at the same time. I'm not sure if you can also do it with an IS lens. Not sure yet about that. Would that be a first in camera history? I don't think you've ever been able to combine electronic image stabilization and regular in -body. internal body image stabilization. You've definitely been able to combine lens stabilization with the in-body image stabilization or ES, electronic stabilization, but I've never heard of electronic meshing with IBIS. That would be interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. I think uh, that will be interesting. And like you said, is it going to be uh, really good? I mean, like the GH5, I think has pretty good um, in-body image stabilization. I think GH5, yeah, compared yeah, to like yeah, Sony. Continue. Sorry. Yeah, no, no. I know there's like a small delay, but it's like, um, but yeah, I think I think the GH5 uh, is one of the best ones in in comparison to other ones. I know Sony's is 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 pretty decent. I mean, here's the thing: anything is better than nothing. And then you add that or you couple that with with um, warp stabilizer, then of course, in conjunction, everything should look pretty good or even with an actual gimbal. You could combine all of this crazy camera stabilization with a gimbal and then warp stabilizer. It'll be just, it will actually might break your brain how smooth it is. <laughs> I, I don't know, or they'll all compete with each other and it'll do some weird funky stuff, but who knows? I'm really excited to see that uh, when we finally get some real footage with IBIS on the R5. Um, interesting thing also that coming with the R5 is the dual card slots. Now they're not dual SD card. One of them is SD and one of them is CFast Express, which Armando, I know you have experience with the CFast Express cards. That's what the C500 Mark II uses uh, for memory. What do you think about the CFast Express in an R5 body? I mean, I think, I mean, for me, and I'm just speaking as a, a, a person who owns the C500 Mark II, currently has the 1DX Mark III right now. Um, having one type of card that works with all cameras as a Canon user is great, personally. I like that. Right. Um, I, I feel that if somebody's switching over from, let's say, Sony, which you've been hearing a lot of people talking about, oh, this is gonna be the camera that's gonna make me switch back yeah. to, to, to Canon, um, it's gonna be a hefty price tag, and I think that's something we need to talk about in terms of like AK shooting, CFast Express, because as you know, a 512 gigabyte CFast Express card on the C500 shooting 6K, not 8K, will only give you 32 minutes of record time. That's half a terabyte. So imagine a 8K will probably only give you maybe 20 minutes, which is stupid, you know? Yeah. Absolutely, and uh, I'm recording my screen right now, so I'll go ahead and switch over because I have this pulled up. We're talking about CFS Express cards and the 512 card, and on B&H Photo, the 512 gigabyte CFS Express card is $600. I don't think that's something that people have been considering when talking about the R5 because everyone's super hyped for the specs, which you, you should be. They're really cool specs. Uh, people are, touting this to be the next 5D Mark II, a revolutionary camera. You have the 5D Mark II. It is a revolution. It. It's still a great camera. Yes. Yeah, but 
there are additional costs that we have to consider. So if this camera is going to be four to $5,000 out the gate body only, and then you're talking about a $600 card just to use the camera, not including any lenses, which RF glass is very expensive. This is still a pretty hefty buy-in to this camera. Even though we're talking $4,000, we're, we're probably talking closer to seven, $8,000 to really get this thing off the ground. And I think that's Canon's strategy. Um, I've always said this, Canon is a lens manufacturer, not a camera manufacturer, you know? So I right. think that the prices, do you, like kind of like printers, they get you with the, with, the, uh, with the printer and they'll throw some ink, but sometimes the ink costs more than the printer. You know what I mean? And that's, right. that's kind of what's gonna happen with this. It's, they're getting you into this ecosystem where you're buying RF lenses that are 2000 plus and I mean, not to take anything away, those RF lenses are amazing. They're beautiful, they're gorgeous. I mean, they they are some of the best lenses that you can buy today. I mean, like the 15 to 35 F2.8 with the IS. I mean, no other manufacturer, like Sony doesn't even have anything comparable to that, you know? Even the 70 to 200, that small package that you're able to have so much power and glass in a very small compact, basically body that you can take with you on the go and put it in a backpack as opposed to as opposed to a massive lens that most other manufacturers have. So that's, I think in my opinion, that's Canon's way of introducing you into this ecosystem. And then there's also all their little knickknacks like the little RF to EF mount with ND filter and all those little, little cool stuff that you're just gonna get sucked into. And next thing you know, this $4,000 camera now becomes a $10,000 adventure. <laughs> and, and even like what you said is the 512 gigabyte card on 6K is only getting us half an hour of record time. So in 8K, it's probably gonna be closer to 20 minutes. So you're not gonna just buy one of these $600 cards if you're wanting to shoot in RAW. You're gonna need two, three, four of these things. So the price just escalates and escalates and escalates. And that's kind of the interesting thing about this camera because then people might say, well, I'll just, I just won't use the 8K. I don't need the 8K RAW. But now you're only using half of the camera. So what's the point of buying the R5? Granted, there is 4K60, there is IBIS, there is Canon Color Science, but you're paying a premium for something that you're not even gonna use. Right, right. And then one thing that, as far as I know, um, you can't record RAW in 4K, which is kind of a bummer. I've heard that. It's kind of a bummer because you know, we shot with the C200 for such a long time. Mm -hmm. um, the RAW was really special in that camera, you know? And and even now, um, you know, with the, with the C500 Mark II, um, you know, 10-bit is great, but if you can't do RAW, you know, I'm not gonna say what's the point, but it ends up being something, I'm, again, not a deal breaker, but I would almost, here's the thing, I would almost want 4K, 5K RAW, like the, like the 1DX Mark III over 8K RAW and then only 10-bit 4K, if that makes sense. Right. No, I, I, I think I agree with you. I think that basically what you're trying to say is that it's an asset that we should have that we don't have and it feels limiting. Even, even if you maybe wouldn't use it that often, it feels like something that should have been there. And I feel like that's always the case with Canon cameras. There's always that that one thing that you're like, why isn't why isn't that there? Granted, the R5 has the least amount of those. Um, we've really been experiencing a lot of that question when it comes to Canon cameras, especially with the R and the RP, RIP, as I like to call it, because when it came out, it didn't <laughs> shoot 24 frames per second. It was just super weird. Canon's, Canon's weird. They do weird things. They do things that don't make sense. The, granted, the R5, again, maybe makes the most sense of any Canon camera in a long time. And I think that's why people are so excited, but there are other things to consider before you purchase or pre-order this R5 camera. Something else that uh, Dave Mays, uh, over the host over at Kinotika brought up to me is that, you know, the Canon R6 is also gonna be coming out in the nearish future with the R5. And that camera might be a better option for a lot of people because it's gonna be everything that the R5 is minus the 8K RAW. And maybe, uh, I heard that maybe it won't have like that little top LCD screen. There might be a few other compromises, but it'll be at a significantly cheaper price with a lot of those important features like IBIS and 4K60 and all those things that most people are searching for or wanting in a Canon camera. It'll have the touch bar. 
<laughs> yeah. Oh no, 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 no. I hope not. Yeah, I, I, I hate the touch bar on my EOS R. I, I almost like just when I, when I didn't have a joystick on the back, I was just like, what is, what is the point? What is the point? Is it's so hard to take photos on the R. That's another reason to get the R5. It's supposed to have a joystick. So a lot of people probably just want it just for that alone, which I, I don't necessarily blame you. Um, now, Armando, you have the 1DX Mark III, or you had the 1DX Mark III. You were borrowing the 1DX yes. Mark III. You've used it. A lot of people are saying that the R5 is going to be similar in a lot of ways to the codec and all that stuff, including, I think, the C-Log, that it's going to be the same C-Log. Um, so what's your experience with the 1DX Mark III then? Because then we can probably pull some information that's going to go into the R5. So the, the big thing, and we talked about this a little earlier about these cameras like the, the C500 Mark II having more dynamic range. One of the ways you get more dynamic range is by using their C-Log2 picture profile. And for example, like the EOS R can shoot in C-Log, but it's not C-Log2, it's just standard C-Log, which cuts dynamic range quite a bit. That's the same thing with the 1DX Mark III. So whenever you're shooting in 4K or, or 10-bit, I should say 10-bit, you're only able to shoot in C-Log, not C-Log 2. That's one of the things I love about the C500 Mark II is that you're able to shoot in C-Log 2 in 10-bit, which means that we don't really need to shoot in RAW. However, with the 1DX Mark III, you are able to get C-Log 2 if you're shooting RAW. But then it goes back to what we were saying earlier. If we're able to get C-Log 2 shooting RAW, that means in order to get, maximize your dynamic range, you're gonna be forced to shoot in 8K RAW which means you better have a lot of money to be able to support that. Well, not to mention and a, just- And a computer that's capable too. Yeah, that's exactly the point I was about to bring up is it's not just about the card storage, which is a big deal. It's not just about the computer storage, like hard drives and all that stuff, which is a big deal. It's really about the power of your computer. I mean, most of us in the YouTube filmmakers, a lot of us were on basic desktops or MacBook Pros and it's, it's just not gonna be able to handle this 8K raw crazy format that the R5 is boasting. I mean, even just the R sometimes is chugs on my MacBook. And I know that even the Mac Pro sometimes <laughs> can have issues with the R codec. And now we're talking about right. 8K raw. I mean, this is that I don't even know how it's going to run. I think it's probably gonna be very slow, especially on programs that aren't as fast like Premiere Pro, which a lot of us are using. Yeah, it's gonna be interesting to see that. And then I know Canon has their own like software development where you can transcode things. It may be a process where you'll be forced to transcode your footage. I know that was the case with the C200 when it first came out and the raw workflow was very new and you know, Premiere didn't have the capability to read those raw files. You had to basically take them to Canon's little proprietary software and then transcode everything to 10-bit. I'm gonna take a guess that may, may be the case. And it just seems so like yeah. involving to be able to, to have to do all that to just get, you know, I don't know. I just feel that that could be, you know, something that may not, I don't know, be yeah. a, not, a be, not be a deal breaker, but something that may not be something that people are gonna be looking forward to, so. Yeah, I think the point that I wanted to make with this video and talking to you, Armando, is that it's not that the R5 is going to be a bad camera. In fact, I think it's going to be fantastic. I think it might be this next revolution that they're saying it's going to be just like the 5D Mark II was. I just think that what people aren't considering is just that this is going to be a very involved camera. It's going to require a lot on the back end in computer power, in storage, in extra money that people just aren't considering because they're blinded by these awesome specs. They think, ooh, big specs means good camera, which it does help, but there's just more than what people, there's just more to it than people are um, really considering, in my opinion. I, I've just seen a lot of positive videos about this camera, but I kind of wanted to bring a little bit of reality when talking about the Canon R5. Yeah, it's true. I think uh, I'm gonna make an analogy here, but it reminds me a lot of where you have these really, you know, entry, I'm gonna say entry point 
luxury vehicles like a BMW that's like, you know, 30,000, but then they don't realize when they go for the maintenance and then it's a $300 oil change or to change out the brakes, it's like $2,000. That's when people are like, whoa, the car payment was cool. I could afford it. But then the maintenance and the other things that people don't really see when they jump into that ecosystem. And I think, you know, like, like Connor was mentioning, this video is more of a reality of like, yes, AK is great. And, you know, we, we always try to, you know, obviously the specs, everything's exciting, but the reality of it is, are you really gonna be using it? And, you know, for some, for us that we have right now, the resources, I mean, we have the C500, we can shoot in 6K raw. We don't even shoot in 6K raw because it's just, it's it's not necessary, you know? It, it, I don't know. I mean, and again, unless you're doing Hollywood stuff or commercial work, I don't think it's necessary. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I loved your analogy. I mean, basically uh, don't buy something at your highest price point. So if you have, say this camera is $4,000 and you have $4,000 to spend on a camera, the R5 is not the camera for you because like we said, it's going to have a much higher price tag to really get started. So maybe consider buying just the regular R or the RP at a lower price point, especially when this new camera comes out, the R and the R, RP should drop in price significantly. Or if you have the patience, you could wait till the R6 finally does come out or consider a different um, camera system if you really need to buy a new camera right now. But just definitely don't buy this camera. If $4,000 is your highest price, it's not the camera for you. And I think that's gonna be the problem. There's gonna be a lot of people that if the camera does come in at 4,000, they're gonna have that, they're gonna scrap up for that $4,000 and then they're gonna realize that it's just gonna be so expensive. And then that usually leads to like a bad experience with, with the camera because, you know, they don't, they don't really, they won't be able to really get to the full potential, you know? Absolutely. Well, all that to say, I do think the R5 is gonna be a cool camera. Uh, it's just, you know, make sure you consider all your options before you buy it. Armando, thanks so much for coming on and just having this g genuine conversation about cameras with me. This is kind of fun, the Zoom meeting quarantine collaboration thing, right? <laughs> Yeah, less stressful, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a little more casual. It's like, it, it doesn't even matter. We don't have to like set up, we don't have to set up. Anyways, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope you guys got something out of it. Let me know what you guys think about the Canon EOS R5 below. I'm definitely curious to see your guys' points. If you guys agree or disagree with anything Armando and I said, make sure to let us know below. Leave a like if you enjoyed the video. And as always, thanks for hanging. <laughs>